I was very fortunate to have been an early investor in Trulier and in Francesco. At this early stage, I invest in people. I invest in the power of disruption. And here specifically, it was disrupting the banking sector through APIs. I believe that APIs are the new interface for the world. He was a repeat founder. He understood the sector very well. He was highly motivated. He was highly dedicated to the mission. And that's why I invested in him. Ciao, Francesco, come stai? Ciao, Kalim. Be- molto bene, molto bene, grazie. <laughs> Tutto bene. <laughs> that's, about, that's about all the, all the Italian, all the Italian that, that I know. I was just fine. <laughs> Appreciate that. How are you doing? I'm, I'm good. Very long week. Like, we are recording on a Friday, and it's this kind of, like, deep drain of, like, just the week, and now... Getting, starting to settle in a little bit of the idea of the weekend, but just like, I don't know, just, you need to just keep going a little bit more. And then, and then Saturday and Sunday, I try to like be with family, but the reality is that just things keep going. Right. So anyway. And how do you rest? I mean, like you, you're the CEO of a very successful company, right? It's valued at 1 billion and a lot of things on your plate. Also now, like the markets are a little bit more uncertain. So how do you actually take the time to rest? How do you unplug? Uh, that's a great question because somebody should should teach me how to do it. Frankly, like I haven't found like the, the silver bullet there. I mean, the basics I find them most useful. Like I try to sleep at night, which means try to have a discipline of when is that you get in bed and when is that you wake up and like, I know that if I sleep less than maybe call it, I don't know, seven hours, frankly, that's not enough. Eight is better, but eight is challenging, but seven is achievable. Anything way less than that, then I feel it for maybe two or three days. And frankly, like when I was in maybe my early thirties, like my twenties, it was better. Like I could like maybe sleep five hours per night and just keep going. Now it's a little bit tougher. And then maybe discipline again on... It's like, I was saying like, it's the weekend. Clearly there's a million things that you may want to continue to do, but I try to be disciplined and say, I'm really gonna escalate the most urgent critical things to spill into the weekend and just leave it open for family. I have a two years old. So just try to focus on that. Now it's a different kind of busy. It's a different kind of, it's a different kind of work. Let's put it this way, but it's needed because it creates that sort of discontinuity that allows you to even just really process and get in a, in a state of mind to be ready the next Monday and just keep going. I mean, I started to explore recently, but it's a, like I do something and then like a stop. It's been like this basically ever since. So I don't know, I'm not very disciplined on that. Got it, got it. No, I also I also start uh, tennis, but I was starting a lot of sports, and then I realized I need to pick a sport that I can do until I'm eighty. Uh, <laughs> so then I kind of picked uh, <laughs> I picked tennis, so then I can be consistent with that. You should play. Right? I picked up tennis as well. So 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 we oh, should really? absolutely play. Absolutely. Next time you're in Stockholm, or if I come to London, then uh, let's do it. Very good. Were you always uh, so disciplined? I mean, you founded and led. Uh, multiple companies were you always so disciplined and also like what were the most painful lessons that you had to learn the hard way let me let me first tackle the first one so my entrepreneurial journey really started when i was call it like 18 years old because i i was very lucky to meet two dear friends while i was in the high school one is my current co-founder luca we knew each other since like we were 14 years old. And the other one is also the founder of a very successful startup nowadays, Massimos, the founder of a company called Eight Sleep in the US. And, and we started together. We were like in the same class in the same school. And, and you should imagine building a company when you are 18, 19 years old is absolutely very different than, than like how you just like would imagine doing something now. And that was very undisciplined. Like, 
maybe maybe the working style was we were showing up in the in the office which was really like an apartment back then maybe at 1 p.m and and just keep going all the night and then maybe at some time like you will stop i don't know wednesday night you go to a club get a little bit drunk and then go back at six in the morning you do another couple of things or just to, like carry on the party and and then you go to sleep and and so that was basically the complete opposite to the discipline that I told you right now, right? So it's something that you, I, I think over time you have more responsibilities, you've just grown up a little bit, your personal life gets more complex, you have less energy, and all those things together also brings you to, to be disciplined. Also, frankly, the broader, the larger, the more important is the company, the more you need to be there for yourself and the team. And I think that so it's just the dynamic at play. The lessons that I'm constantly relearning every couple of months, it's how, how difficult it is to optimize at the same time for the short term and the long run. Where you are allowing yourself to take the shortcut to do something in the near term, and then how that compromises the long run. And, and this is applicable to a million of different things. Like, I'll make an example. When you hire someone, like we write reviews, it's very standard. And we all come with different point of views, pros and cons. And, and often, like you reread all those reports and then you can see the seeds of what this person is going to be. Sometimes, like in a good or a bad way, but let's take like the, the, the negative example here. Maybe it happened that you made some decision because it kind of makes sense in the short term. You really need that source of like critical expertise. You need that sort of role to be filled fast. And then you're allowing yourself to, to accept other shortcomings. And then inevitably, six months later, you end up maybe departing ways because of that, right? But something that you clearly pointed out six months before. So, so then the question is, again, maybe having the discipline to, to balance the two things. The reality is, it's tough. And I'm saying like, I'm relearning these lessons because this manifests in so many different ways. It could be, you know, delivering a certain feature to a customer, uh, delivering a piece of work that is not at the level of quality. You would like to see that done, but you need that. Like it's, it's straight strategy decision like that always happened like there's always inevitably inevitably this decision that gets you to um to do something that sounds right in the short term but you already know that in the long run this is gonna bite at you bite back at you and and then we are there you're like ah, i knew it but it's inevitable you just like do it again so I try to not make exactly the same mistake or or at least like no like this thing is gonna is gonna be problematic in the future, may accept that. And maybe I can risk manage that. And, and that's maybe like the better way to look at those things. Like you can accept some risk in the future, but you need to be, you need to understand what you're doing and put in place, call it like a framework to manage that risk that you're accruing in making that specific decision. Easier said than done frankly. So trying to balance the short term needs with actually the long term uh, advantages of whatever you want to implement or if you want to hire someone. Yeah, I mean, hiring was an example. But like, again, there are a million different, like this is more a pattern in general. Like, I think there are a million of different decisions that fall into this bucket. Take me back in time to the moment when you decided to start Trulier. It's 2016, you work as a VP of strategy for Fove and what happens next? Yeah, so so basically at that time I was in San Francisco. That was a very transformational experience, been there for about seven years, a little bit less than that. And at that point in time, I was doing two things at the same time. I was running an investment fund called Mission Market and being partnered there and the fund is still not operating, but it's still kind of alive and the fund itself like, is doing great. And maybe this is one of the regrets of my life that why I haven't done fund too. But anyway, maybe in the future, who knows, right? That said, so I was doing that thing and one of our portfolio company was Fove. 
a VR company, two brilliant founders, but I wouldn't say young and inexperienced because that would be unfair, but certainly like they had an issue of like, they were both Japanese in Tokyo and they were a little bit new of Silicon Valley. And so I said, okay, maybe I can help you. And I just got along well. And so I decided to help them out. But, but really like was a point in time where I was looking for a challenge. Like I was looking for just like going back to entrepreneurship and being an operator. And I think especially at that time in San Francisco, maybe it's the same now, but certainly at that time, I really felt this almost like a pressure to go and do something so like big and meaningful because everybody was like, not just building a company, but building a company and building that company in the right way. Like so many people that I knew that I invested, like it felt like, look, this is an incredible time to just try to build a company. You know, I believe like starting companies, whatever is the idea, more important is that you have enjoyment in doing that company with people that you like and people that you get well along and that it turns out to be a meaningful experience for you. So I knew that Luca, I mean, it's not a secret, Luca, uh, sometimes this is a little bit uh, strange to say, but Luca at that time was at Plaid, which years later would become like, anyway, like some, some sort of competitor in Europe as well. But but he, he left there and I was researching bank APIs in Europe because I saw also like this, this regulation happening. And, and it was like a little bit of a eureka moment. Banks in Europe are building APIs, which is great. Something great is going to come up from there. Initially, we thought this is, could be a Twilio of financial services, a Twilio of banks, so to speak. And Luca had that critical knowledge from the U.S. perspective, and we were really willing to do something together. So, Tell us more about the, the regulation. Did the regulation happen? Like, when did it happen? Like, 20, right. 2015? Or when did it happen? Because I guess that had, like, a very big impact on the financial services in Europe. It did. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so I think the regulation has been kind of, like, passed and voted in 2015 or 16. can't remember exactly. But really, like, got in fruition in the UK first in 2018, the back of 18, and in rest of Europe in 19, like six months later or something. Um, let, let me describe what is this regulation I'm talking about. So different names. 2016, UK was part of the European Union. And in Europe, we have this payment service directive is a body of laws that describes how financial services and payment firms needs to put in place a number of lie requirements and, and comply with regulations. And the acronym is PSD2. And there was a second revision called 2, so PSD2. In that body of laws, there was two interesting things. They were setting up two new regulated roles, two new financial service roles. One called account information service, which would allow companies holding that license to connect to the banks and grab, fetch data that pertains to the bank account of consumers at that bank. So it's literally your bank balance, your list of accounts, your transactional data, and, and do something with that. So is is regulating the access to that source of data. And the other piece of the regulation was creating a new role called Payment Initiation Service, PIS, which basically is the same concept. I access, of course, everything happened in a permission way, right? Like, like you need to require user consent. You cannot access all, all of that without user consent. But provided that there is user consent, I can initiate a payment, a bank payment to the bank from a third party website. So effectively using your um, kind of wire transfer functionality built in your bank account as a payment method for third party companies like an e-commerce website. And that was at that time like built in the regulation for different reasons. Like that was years and years of lobbying of kind of companies that at that time were doing, and, and some of them are still doing something called screen scraping, 
which is basically doing those activities in an unregulated manner by reverse engineering the portals of the banks to grab the data or make payments. And the regulation was creating, first of all, a liability environment on how you do that. Like just what are the requirements that we are going to ask those firms to have and how they should securely handle the data or the payments? What, what are just the set of rules around that? But critically, on the other side, was also mandating the banks to offer real APIs, so application programming interfaces, like digital portals, digital adapters that are designed for that usage. They're not like the user portal that you're reverse engineering and scraping. It's actually a programmatic access to a bank account. That's kind of the law. Of course, it's a little bit more complex than that. There's a lot of regulation, capital requirements, things that you have to do. But like in synthesis, I would say that that is kind of the description of the law. TrueLayer was in 2018 the, I don't know if really like the first, but we were, we were like among the first 10 companies on 1st of January 2018, I believe, to receive approval to operate as a PAS and AAS. So we were just like front front of line to get that authorization from the SCA and, and ready to go. Now, little we knew that the having the license was great, but we didn't find APIs on the other side. The banks weren't really ready on, on 1st of January mm-hmm. to, to start operating. Like it was basically like the law was saying, third party companies, you need to get a license, but the banks, you need to grade APIs. And third party companies, we're getting the license, but the banks were not creating APIs. And it's been a long journey to, to push the banks in that direction. But I, I feel that maybe not everywhere in Europe, but in the vast majority of places in Europe and certainly in the UK, we, we really can, came a long way to build those APIs and get them to work at a, at a good level of standard. That regulation is so disruptive is that is because other companies can offer services on top of all those accounts, right? Uh, This is also one. And the second, that that maybe banks didn't have any interest to offer you an API, but now they're in a way forced by the regulation. Like why why was that so so impactful in the industry? Yeah, I think it was impactful for a number of reasons, but the core is increasing competition in financial services, creating new ways of doing things that otherwise as you're saying, banks, they don't have much incentive to do. And one is making your bank data portable, which means allowing other banks, other companies that are not banks to get information of that data. That data is quite precious in a way because identifies you as a unique consumer. It it is some part of digital identity, if you want, or, or just identity, like, if you go and rent out an apartment, they're most likely going to ask you, I don't know, a bank account statement, just establish that you have an history in the country and you're living there and, and you cannot pay and you can afford to pay that rent or, or get the loan. So, so that data is some sort of like trail and in this case, digital trail of, of a number of things like what is your, your salary, where do you spend your money, how you are using your money. Are you a um, nefarious actor? So I, I can mm-hmm. establish whether you open this bank account just to maybe trade on a marketplace and be a scammer versus like your real legitimate person with, I don't know, you just do the grocery and, and fill up your, your gas tank or things like that. Like it just carries a, a trove of information that can be extracted and then used in different contexts to lend money to maybe like help you put together your finances, to check and verify who you are, what you do, and make a lot of like risk-based decisions. That creates competition of its own because all of a sudden that data that used to be just lodged at your bank now can be available for somebody else to maybe lend you money. And that is competition, right? And in payments, similar story. Like if you look at the payment market, I mean, it's, it's maybe, the, the poster child of uh, Holy Govoli, if, if, if not just like, it's monopolistic competition. Like you have two companies. 
Mastercard, and Mastercard and Visa, of course, like just having like the lion's share of the pie. And then now you have some growing companies like Apple Pay and PayPal, which, by the way, they are still at the end of the day, just building on top of that monopoly. It's not that really they disrupted entirely. Maybe they will in the future. I don't know. But like, by matter of fact, as today, they are one of the largest card processor of Visa and MasterCard. So it's it's more like that they built on top. It's not that they are really creating a competition. And so I find it very powerful that, you know, maybe in a very centralized and bureaucratic way, like often Europe does, but like they decided to go and say, can we create more competition in payments? And can we create an alternative where somebody else can connect to the banks and leverage for instance, SIPA as, as the settlement rail or faster payment in the UK to settle transactions without going through Visa and MasterCard rails. And, and so I think that this is extremely disruptive. A lot of stuff can be built on top of that. We, frankly, at the very beginning, we didn't know maybe completely like what sorts of use cases where we're going to be more, more powerful, faster or more impactful. We learned that along the way, and we really had a strategy of, especially at the very beginning, like going very broad and try to like just enable developers to do their thing. And they will tell us what sorts of direction is working, what sorts of direction is not working. And I think over time, we all realized, not just ourselves, but the entire industry, that I think payments is a very ubiquitous use case and open banking which, which is maybe the more commercial name of this technology that three years ago wasn't even existent, right? So now it works. And you need to bring this new technology to the mainstream and payments happen to be maybe not just the most valuable, but also the mainstream way to get everyone in a given country or anyway, like a very large share of the population in a given country to get in fruition of this technology, get used with the concept of it and then you can build on top. It's, a, it's a more like a problem of how do you adopt new technology? Where do you start from? What are use cases that are working or not? So as of two layer, like we over time, and that already happened maybe three years ago, and certainly like two years ago was like a moment where we said strategically, we want to build maybe more prohemently in payments and just rethink ourselves as a, as a modern day Visa MasterCard. Like, can, can we go and, and build disruption in that world and create alternatives for merchants? If I'll have to summarize what Trulair does is like one, you connect with a lot of APIs from a lot of banks. So that kind of goes a little bit horizontally. Then you kind of open up for a lot of innovation that developers can build on top. But now you try to go maybe vertical or kind of niche into the payments so then you can offer payment across whatever industries. Did I understand that correctly? That, that is precisely true. And uh, the sort of verticalization is there is a layer of pure infrastructure and let's call it like aggregation. Like all the banks are building those APIs in a slightly different manners. They all have maybe different technical standards depending on the country you are. Or for instance, there's no documentation how that API works. Like you need to go and, and just try and figure out the quirkness. If I send this descriptor to HSBC, it's gonna be different than Lloyd. So, but that has an impact on conversion rate. Like, and you need to do that for thousands of different connections. So that ends up being a very like a, an aggregator of all those banks together and an operational kind of like you operate the infrastructure, the results. Like you still need to put a lot of love into all those micro details that eventually makes everything work. And then over time, you're precisely right. Like we built what, I mean, like a lack of creativity, frankly, like we, we call value added services or use case kind of APIs where we realize we want to build more into the payment use case and start understanding where is that Payment is a vast ocean. Like you, you can get lost in the world of payment. It's a trillion dollar market. So you start breaking up payments into industries, into use cases, where is that you may have product market fit and one little 
bit after another, you start creating features, adding components, adding more business logic that allows you to go into an industry and find product market fit for that specific use case. And, and that resulted into a couple of things. One, it increased our overall value that we are adding to the customers and therefore our ability to charge for that and you know measure that maybe from a uh, something called take rate like how much of the value of that transaction you're able to retain as value that goes into the platform and cost to the merchant right and the latter is just increase the addressable market for every single use case because you are requiring less work from the merchant there are entire segments entire use cases entire industries that will not touch just the bare metal you need to just build the entire like thing with the optional and you know if you're building a car like it's not just like the wheel and and whatever like the motor like you also need to add all the mirrors all the lights or everything otherwise they they wouldn't touch that so so that that is why we went vertical and that's why we are building in that direction to, to build on your parallel with, with the cars, you know, like instead of having only like the car, the hardware, now people expect also maybe the software inside. So then it's actually a little bit more usable and personable to their selves, right? So this is probably what you do with um, e-commerce or also gaming. So not only maybe the infrastructure layer, but also all the value added services. That's absolutely right. Like I like your metaphor is a little bit more modern day and more like old school, like where, where air conditioning still feel like a valuable option in a, in a car, <laughs> but like, yes, you're right. <laughs> let's let's uh, change gears a bit. Let's get personal. What was the most challenging period in scaling True Layer, and and how did you overcome it? Two or three years, like between two and three years after, like we started the company, I think I realized, okay, this is not just anymore. Myself, Luca, a bunch of like crazy folks that. We managed to to get on board. It is starting to be a thing of its own with people like having all their expectations into this project. And you have a lot of responsibility for their well-being and for their ambitions. You have a responsibility for their careers. You have a responsibility to give them, provide them. And frankly, I don't know if I was ready to get that fast at that point. And, and if you add that, like the uncertainty anyway of an early stage startup, we are trying to compete with some of the largest companies in the world. So clearly it's a company that needs to, to need to raise a lot of capital and, and we all perceive like how hard it's going to be to do that. So, so you start a company, you have that source of like crazy enthusiasm, which like everything is possible. Then you need to start to deliver, like you have them, some money in the bank, maybe not all the money in the bank, but some money in the bank. You need to start to deliver all your initial promises. Your vision is to start be break down into, I need to deliver this and I need to deliver this, AP, this KPI and this growth and hire this person. This person has a, has a career that wants to fulfill and there are personal stories. So then you put everything that I just described into like the same pot and it, it can be a dark place and an overwhelming feeling, especially no matter like how experienced you are, but I think just like how fast that happens. I don't believe that is a function of age, is a function of maybe experience and expectation and just like don't be surprised that you get there so fast. And I think like I got a little bit surprised and, and the reaction was really, I mean, nothing crazy. Just like we were talking about sleeping. I mean, started to lose sleep. I started to, to realize that I wasn't completely in control of the drive and myself. And that created like tremendous anxiety and I had to cope with that and, and eventually overcome. So. But it's been a year of transformation of like realization that you are now in in a different stage of the company and you need to cope with that. And I learned that there's a lot of our things in life and you need to be able to do them and don't be scared about that. But like 
eventually I think like, you know, there, there could be two reactions. You, you try to fight or you, you fly effectively. Right. And, and I choose to fight it. And then eventually the sleep came back and tried, like we were talking about discipline, like maybe setting a little bit of discipline. Don't try to like overextend yourself every single second, accept what you can control, what you can't, but clearly has been, um, I think like tough year, not necessarily negative year, just like tough year as in the amount of transformation change that I had to put into that process. Based on, on, on deal room, you raised $130 million at the end of 2021, valuing the company at $1 billion. And arguably, end of 2021 was the top of the market. The valuations were crazy. How do you navigate those high expectations that maybe were set at the end of 2021? I think this is this is the the challenge of the year, not just for Surveyor, but for the entire class that raised in 2021, one way or another, and clearly like growth stage companies, maybe even more so. I mean, there's no secret formula. Like the reality is that the vast majority of us will have to what what is called like grow into your valuation, which means basically allow yourself enough runway, enough time to push the business to the level where with the new multiples of, of this, this new market and multiple compression that, that happen, you are still in your old valuation or possibly exceed that, right? So how you do that? Well, there are a few things. The first one, you need to control your cost. And, for, uh, and this is tough because the, this whole thing happened very fast. Like two years, for two years, the refrain was you are a little bit like you're not spending fast enough. And I'm not saying that necessarily this is kind of the advice that we were getting from investors, but it was certainly like the sentiment of the market. And, and you know that if you are not spending fast enough, maybe it's your competitor that, that is spending faster than you. And, and that creates FOMO, that creates kind of competition, that creates like this land grab, blitz scale scenario where everything needs to happen at light speed. And so that was really the ethos of the last two or three years. And in maybe even three months, not even six months, just investor and the market completely like shifted. And now like you need to like unwind and, and retrain a behavior that, that was there for three years into now. Oh, we need to look at pro profitability, sustainable growth, cost control, how much runway do I have? I mean, all sensible things, and don't get me wrong, it's not that we haven't done before cost control or anything like that, but clearly there was a different optimization goal. Like what was like the optimal setup has changed so dramatically into a few months. So we at Relayer, we had to do what many companies are doing. So we, we, had, we, we did this summer a very painful um, like downsize of the business of about 10% of the headcount that allowed us to increase our runway and be comfortable of having multiple and multiple years of runway in front of us being rightly sized to uh, operate and still be extremely aggressive. Because the other thing is that you can completely withdraw from, like you can negate a strategy that you had and that you believe like still valuable today. So you need to find this compromise between continue to be aggressive and grow because we said we, that we want to grow into whatever valuation or whatever goal that we have. But on the other side, you need to be rightly sized. And so we have done a thing like this balancing act and think every other company is doing kind of the same. And you see that even from like the most successful companies in the world. And this is so unfortunate from one side, from the employee perspective as a company, maybe it is a reaction. Like, I, I don't know. I, I, I believe that clearly we, we all got challenged last year and the year before, like how fast you can do things, like how, how much money you can throw the problem. And, and we all realized that eventually you have marginal gains and it's kind of like you plateau, you, you, you find like a ceiling where like in order to achieve up one, like an, an increase again of like 
small gain, you just need to add so much more money and that becomes like inefficient growth. And I think like we all learned these lessons now, is this lessons going to be avoided in the next whatever, you know, economy expansion in maybe 10 years or five years? I don't know. I think like, I don't, I think, don't so. think so. <laughs> I think like we're going to be exactly where we were at some point in the future. Uh, and yeah. it depends from like macro factors that I think like we, we don't have time to, to talk about in this, in this session. Yep. Also, I know that Chamat Palipatia, he said that he recommends to all of his companies to have a runway until quarter one, 2025. Yeah, I agree. So the last question, if Francesco from 10 years ago would listen to this episode, what would you tell him? I don't know precisely. I, I think like if I need just need to look at my kind of like career arc, I started as part of a group. And for a very long time, I always saw myself as part of a group. Like my success was bounded to the dynamic of a group, uh, which by the way, it's probably like what, what every successful person in the world is bounded to a group of people that are successful in the same way. And that uh, it's completely perfectly fine. But in that process, you need to really believe yourself and understand that your contribution to the group is as important as, as any other member, not less. You need to understand like where, where is the group and where is yourself? Like your identity different than the identity of the group and understand where you are in this process. And I think for me right now, after, after many years, I'm way more aware of who I am and how I'm part of the group of people that makes Trulayer successful or, or where I enjoy to work with, but I, I have an understanding of myself. I know where I am, what I do, what are the things that I'm good at, the things that I'm not good at, and I'm trying to be upfront and, and design around all those things. I think 10 years ago, 15 years ago, 20 even, it was really more chaotic and, and more like I think at adolescence where, where, you know, like you, you have a, a view of yourself that goes through the lens of like the group you belong into, which is different eventually. Mm -hmm. I like that. So believe in yourself, know your strengths and your contribution to the group. Absolutely. But look, may, may just be that I think it's, it's, you know, like those sort of, can you go back in time, like teach a lesson to yourself? The reality is that you need to make, you, you need to do all those steps of growth yourself it's very hard to like they, they can teach you they can tell you you can relate you can rush understand that but you need to go through the learning yourself there's no other way to 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 just grow and so what what is scary you know it's it's not what everything that happened is is more thinking about in 20 years what is going to be the advice that francesco in 20 years is going to give to to me now and and i don't know frankly i don't know that's the thing i will have to do the learning myself love it love it i actually do this exercise quite often thank you very much for for taking the time francesco grazie mille grazie a te thank you very much it was really fun